uh, Exodus chapter 33. We're going to start at verse 12, actually. That's my mistake. It's not verse 14. It's verse 12. Verse 12. And as is the custom, I'd like for us to read it together. <clears throat> and I usually have the words up on the screen. However, uh, I made a mistake and forgot uh, that one today. So I'd like for us just, if you could read from your pew Bible or your own Bible. <clears throat> We're going to read from verse 12 to 17. Verse 12 to 17. Let's read it together. Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. Please continue. And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I am pleased with you, and I know you by name. Amen. Uh, and also, I'm going to go to the next page of your Bible and read chapter 34, verses 8 through 10. You don't have to read out loud, just follow along with me. Verse, uh, excuse me, chapter 34, verses 8 through 10. Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshipped. O oh Lord, if I have found favor in your eyes, then let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our wickedness and our sin, and take us as your inheritance. Then the Lord said, I am making a covenant with you. Before all your people, I will do wonders, never before done, in any nation in all the world. The people you live among will see See how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. <clears throat> the next three weeks we're doing a mini-series called God in Our Life. God in Our Life. And today is part one of that series, God in Our Journey. Let me start with a story. There was a, a remote rural or countryside area that had just gotten electricity. They, the power company in the city had finally built uh, a grid, a power grid for this remote area in the countryside. And so now the houses there no longer needed, you know, gas lanterns or, or fires or, or, you know, that old-fashioned way of, of heating or lighting. They now had power, electric power. And as the company was checking the, the houses there, they found that one house was using a very small amount of power relative or related to the other houses. And so they sent a person out to check the house. And so this man went to the house and found uh, the lady who lived there, very old lady, and, you know, this is the countryside. So the lady is like, hey, how are you doing? Come on in, get some food, have some rest, you know, that kind of thing. And he said, oh, no, I'm just here to check the power meter, to check if you were using enough power. And so he checked the meter, and, yeah, it was very low. She barely used any electricity compared to the other houses. And then he told the, the lady, he said, ma'am, you know, you have electricity, and I want to know, are you using your electricity just like everybody else? And 
Oh, she said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, it's, I'm so thankful now that we have electricity. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Uh, you know, at night when it gets dark, I can't find my lanterns, my gas lanterns. So I turn on the lights, and I turn on the gas lanterns, and then I can turn the lights right off again, and I'm fine. And so the man was shocked <laughs> to hear that story, that she had all the power available to her, yet she only used that little bit so that she could go on living how she had lived before. And that is often how many people who say that they believe in God, that say they know God, live their life. They have the power. They have the ability. They have the resources to have a dramatically new way to live. And yet they are satisfied to just keep God at a certain distance or to just get enough out of church just to get by and just kind of live as they had lived before. And it's amazing. It's not sad. It's not terrible. It's just to me, it's, well, to us, it's amazing, you know, that we would just be satisfied with so little. God never wanted to be a certain distance from his people. And that's what he's saying in, in these next few chapters of Exodus, from 33 on to 35 there, that he's telling his people, Israel, look, I'm, your go I'm going to be your God. And if I'm going to be your God, I'm not just some wonderful idea. I'm not just some existence out here floating in space. I am God, and if I'm your God, I want to be right where you walk. I want to be right where you live, right where you sleep. I want to give you the ability to live a new way of life every single day, every moment. That's the one, that's who I am. That's the kind of God I am. And that's what he's trying to communicate to Israel in these next few chapters, few chapters. And so that's what our series is about. It's about God in, in our life. Not over our life, not around our life, but in our life. If you have faith, if you have a religion, it should affect the way that you live every single day of your life. That is the message of the Bible. And if God is in your life, if you have belief in Christ Jesus, if you've given your life to Him, you've trusted God with your life, you'll know that just like Israel, He has set you on a journey. And so today our subject is God in our journey. <clears throat> God in our journey. Now we are all, of course, on a journey. For Israel, that journey was from Egypt, where they were living for 400 years in slavery. slavery. And at the time of Moses, God miraculously, in, in his power, delivered them and brought them out of Egypt. And he says, I'm not just bringing you out to get you into the desert. I'm bringing you out to live in a place that's flowing with milk and honey. That's prosperous, that's beautiful, that's a wonderful place compared to this place, Egypt, where you've been living. And now you're going on a journey, a journey. And anyone who has given their life to God has also in their hearts, in their own life, set out on a similar journey from where you were, from who you were, slavery to sin, purposeless living, an empty life, to the place where God has prepared for you, where the love lasts forever. It is eternal life. You're on a journey to freedom from sin, to having purpose in your life, to having fulfillment in your life, to having peace in any situation, to having harmony in any relationship, to have hope in difficult times. God is putting you on a journey, right, to get to that place. And God does not just, hey, send you off and say, good luck, have a good trip, we'll see you out the other end. He wants to be 
with us every step of the way. I'd like you for I'd like for you to repeat after me. This world is not my home. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. I'm just passing through. Yeah, now I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. Get out of my way. No, I'm just kidding, don't say that. Uh, there was a song that's actually a hymn. It's called This World Is Is Not My Home. I'm just passing through. I never liked that song, but that part always stuck out in my mind. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, 11, he says that we are aliens and strangers in the world. And the writer of Hebrews says that, that you know, we are not here, we don't have a, an enduring city. We are looking for a city that is to come. And what they're saying is, look, this, this is not our home. And for those of you who are here, not ja who are non-Japanese, that's most of us here, you know how that feels, don't you? You're, this, is, this land is not your land. You're just passing through. For how many years, for how many months, you don't know. So we are aliens and strangers. It's a different culture, a different language, different way of, of eating food. And this world is not, this place is not our home. We're, we're just passing through. We're on, we are on a journey. We are people on a transit. And we're just passing through. That is the message of the Bible. You know, in uh, my, my neighborhood, I live just one train stop past Mitaki going that way and it's called Nagatsuka and it's more of a suburb of Hiroshima just outside the downtown area and there's always new homes being built there's a lot of old houses getting torn down there's always noise that I have to deal with and always you know hammering and, and jackhammering and all that stuff but new homes are going up all the time and every time Nahomi and I walk home from the station or I'm riding home I you know I see these nice beautiful houses, you know, three-story houses, you know, they're about the size of this church. And I'm just like, wow, it's a nice place. And, and we have like just a three LDK kind of, you know, apartment. And every time Nahomi and I go for a walk around our neighbor, you know, I'm looking at, oh, it's a nice house. And I ask Nahomi, would you like to live in a house like that? And she says, mm -hmm, you know, and, and I'm like, I'm never going to be able to afford a house like that. And but really, every time I look at those houses, I kid you not, every single time I look at a new house or a big, beautiful house, those words come to me. This world is not my home. I am just passing through. There's no need for me to get tied down to a piece of land or a big old building that has my name on it when eventually I'm going to just pass through it anyway. There is, a different, there is a different place where I can rest my head. In the end, that is my home because I am just passing through. This world is not my home. I am on a journey. Uh, you know, every few years I have to renew my citizenship. I'm actually a Philippine citizen, not American. And I have to renew my passport just to live here and go to the States or you know, most of you have an, an, an alien registration card and you have to put your, your country's stamp on there. And every single time, I have to figure out what citizenship I have or what my, my status here is. Every single time I remember those words, I am a stranger and an alien in this land. And whatever my passport may say, whatever stamp is on that piece of paper, in my heart, the stamp of Jesus Christ has been laid. And my citizenship is not on earth. My citizenship is not in Japan or, or in any other country. It is in heaven. And if you are a person who believes in the Bible, if you are a person that's given your life to God, if you believe in the cross, you are a citizen of heaven. You are a son of God. This world is not your home. You are just passing through. You are on a journey. And what does that mean? That means it means many things, but one of those things is that, look, 
in this land, Hiroshima, excuse me, Hiroshima, Japan, we run across people and uh, there's a culture and, and the, the religion of, of that, you know, <laughs> when we die, we come back here. This is our home. That when we die, it's called umi, u, ume kaeru. Umu kaeru, ume kaeru. To be reborn, to have reincarnation. Umu is to be born, and kaeru means to return. And that is the general belief in this land. But the Bible's teaching is that, no, 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 no. You don't die and then come to life again in the same place. That this world, this universe, this place that we live in, is, is something that we're all just passing through. And that it is appointed for a man to die only once. And then we are judged. That's written very clearly for us in Hebrews chapter 9. That there is no such thing as reincarnation, but there is one life and one death and one chance to give it up and get it right. We are not, this is not our home. We're just strangers and aliens, everybody. And we're just passing through. We are on a journey. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> that journey is, of course, to eternal life. To end up uh, to a place that many would, would call heaven. But it's just not, it's not only where you're going, which is what is being communicated in today's scripture. Yes, Israel is going to the promised land. They're going to get there, probably. But Israel's problem is not that they get there or not. Israel's problem is who's going to go with them. It's not just where you're going, but who goes with you. And Moses is pleading with God, God, please, if we're going to go, you need to go with us. We need to have you. We need your presence to go with us. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? God, we need you to come with us. For Israel, they could not go anywhere without the presence of of God. And for us who are Christians, we cannot go anywhere on our journey without the Son of God. Jesus' name is Emmanuel, God with us. We cannot go anywhere without the Son of God. Jesus says in Revelation chapter 3, he says, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. I'm going to live with him who accepts me into his heart. I'm here. I'm your God and I'm here to go with you on your journey. You cannot go anywhere without me. And then there's a promise he gives to us in Matthew chapter 28. Believe that I'm with you. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Israel, they started their journey at the foot of Mount Sinai where God's glory came down in the form of a cloud and thunder and lightning and there's an earthquake and a blah, big old blast of the trumpet and there was fear, holy, righteous fear, awe and reverence for the holiness of God. That was Israel's start of their journey. But for us, Christians, our journey starts at the foot of Calvary, where God's Son didn't come down, but God's Son went up to be humiliated, to be ridiculed, to be crucified, to take our sins on Himself. It didn't cause fear or awe, reverence, it caused laughter and mockery. But for those who believed in him and put their faith on him, it gave eternal life and salvation. Israel's journey started at the foot 
of Mount Sinai where God gave his people the law, the Ten Commandments, the civil law, the moral law, the ceremonial law. And it showed Israel the difference between holiness and sin. But our journey as Christians starts at the foot of Calvary, the hill where God's perfect and sinless Son took the punishment for our sin onto himself. And at the foot of the cross is where we start our journey, where Jesus Christ, the Son of God, took our penalty for sin. Jesus Christ's death on the cross means that God can now be in our journey. You see, without this cross, God cannot be in our journey. Without this cross, God only stays as a distant voice calling to us. I want to be in your life. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And that's as far as he gets. But because of this cross, we can open that door and we can let the Son of God in and he can be with us. And he can be in our journey. Thank God for that cross. God said in Deuteronomy, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Years later, Jesus promised to us, I will never, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. It's not just where we're going. It's who goes with us. Uh, when I graduated from college, I took a trip across the United States from Los Angeles to New York, and we drove from L.A. to New York and back. We took one month, and we hit everything. We hit Las Vegas. We went to Colorado. We climbed the mountains. We went to the north border. We crossed into Canada and Niagara Falls. And on the way back, we went down into Mexico and Texas. We, you know, we went fishing, we went camping, we hit all the, the major baseball stadiums, all the history on that. We saw America. It was great. Had all these wonderful, unforgettable experiences. If, you know, I recommend if you ever have time, travel across that great, great country. It's, it's a wonderful place. It's cheap, too. The camping was like a dollar a night uh, because all they had was like a dirt path, like a dirt thing. And, Anyway, we had all these great, great times. But it wasn't really the trip that was great, was it? I went there, I took this trip with, with three of my best buds from college. At a time of our life where we were just, you know, just ready to live. And that's what made the trip worth it. It wasn't just where we're going and what we were doing. It's who I was with that made this journey worth it. And Israel was going to this wonderful promised land and they're going through the desert. But it's who went with them that counted the most. And Jesus is saying, look, I want to be in your journey every step of the way. Every move you make, every decision you, you make, every direction you go in. When I gave my life to Christ as a boy, I started on this journey and that time, at that time, I didn't realize what I know now. That I can't go anywhere without Jesus Christ. And that Jesus Christ doesn't want me to go anywhere without him. And because I believe in Jesus, everything in my life comes from him. My peace comes from Jesus. My strength comes from Jesus. My love comes from Jesus. My wisdom comes from Jesus. Everything I do in life is not without His Holy Spirit guiding me. It's not where you're going, it's who goes with you. It's Jesus Christ. Israel could not go anywhere without the presence of God. We cannot go anywhere without the Son of God. And we cannot go anywhere without the Spirit of God without the Spirit of God. 
Paul says, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Jesus says to us, when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears. And He will tell you what is to come. That He is the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of Christ. The third person in the Trinity. Uh, the scriptures, these scriptures that are written up here, they're talking about the Spirit of God leading His people. And it talks about the people of God being guided by God's Spirit. Why? Because the best journeys, the best trips, are the ones that have good leaders or a good guide. Leaders who know where they are going to take you. And there is no better person to lead us on our journey, no better person than God's Spirit. Uh, this is the, my, my brother J.R. And he came, uh, if you remember, back in April around Easter time. And finally he visited me. I'd lived here for eight years and finally my, my family comes and visits. And you have no idea how hard it was to find a regular picture of my brother and me. Uh, but found one. And when he visited us, you know, I knew I had work, but I knew I had to take some time off. Because if he's going to come to Hiroshima, he needed someone to show him around. Show him the best places to eat, to get some shopping done, and, and all the, the sites. Now, I could have asked some of my friends to do it. Or I could have asked some of you to do it. And I'm sure you would have happily obliged. But I knew that there would be, there would be no one better to, to be a guide for him around Hiroshima than me. Why? Two reasons. Number one, I knew Hiroshima. I know this place. I've been here eight years as a foreigner. I know which places speak English well enough. I know which places have a good menu for the foreign belly. I knew which places had the cheap deals where they don't, you know, uh, get the, the tourists. And I knew which places would be interesting for tourists. You know, like the Peace Park, um, Peace Memorial Museum, don't go there. If you're if you're having if you want to have a good time if you want to be depressed and and feel heavy go to the Peace Park Museum and and feel terrible but if you want to have a good time anywhere there, but there is good I knew that because I knew Hiroshima I'd lived here and the second reason I was the best person to to be a guide for my brother is because I knew my brother I'm from the same neighborhood I know his language Southern Californian I spoke dude you know. <laughs> Uh, and I knew what he, what he liked and what he, di he didn't care for. So there was nobody better to guide him, to be his leader as he journeyed through this wonderful land. There was no one better to be our leader, to be our guide, than the Holy Spirit of God as we go through our journey for two reasons. He made our journey. He made this path that we walk on. He knows the best place for us to be. He knows the places we need to avoid. And when we go through a difficult place, when we go through a time when it's not easy, He brought us there. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. Okay, He's going to take me to the still waters. He's going to take me through the valley of the shadow of death. But wherever He takes me, His rod and His staff will comfort me. Right? Because he is, there's no one better to be our leader and to be our guide than the Holy Spirit of God. And what does that mean? To that you know he is our leader. He, the Holy Spirit leads us. Well, it means two things. It, you know, a leader answers two questions. It answers, uh, where am I going? That's the direction part. And it answers, why am I here at this particular time? And that's purpose. The Holy Spirit of God in our journey gives us our direction and our, our purpose. Why am I here? With God in our journey, we're not just you know, wandering around, I like this, oh, and, th and that catches our attention and I'll try this for a while or I'll do that for a minute. And we're just aimless. But the Holy Spirit of God puts us on a direction 
that anything that we do has a purpose. And what is that purpose? It's eternal life. It's the eternal purpose. There is an eternal purpose for you being in Japan. There is an eternal purpose for you being in the office that you are in. There is an eternal purpose for you living in the apartment building that you're living in. There is an eternal purpose for the relationships that you are in. Why am I single right now? Because God has a purpose for that. Why am I in the company I am in right now? Because I can't find a job anywhere else? No, because God has a purpose for you being there. Why am I living here now? Because of my circumstances? No, because God's eternal purpose has set you here before you, you were even born. Why am I having difficulty? Because life is difficult? Maybe. No. Because God has a purpose for your difficulty. He has a purpose in it. He is our, our guide. And what does a guide do? Well, a guide provides two things. He provides wisdom and he provides insight. Wisdom, why wis wisdom? To prepare. God gives us wisdom to get ready. He gives us wisdom to make good decisions. Our Holy Spirit, our God, gives us wisdom to avoid unnecessary danger or mistakes. He gives us wisdom. But also the God gives us insight into the particular points in our journey. We get to this point and we can ask, what, what, what why do I have this person as my friend? What purpose does this serve? And the Holy Spirit gives us that insight. Why am I you know, helping these people out at this particular time? What, what eternal purpose does that serve? God gives us insight. You know, if you go to the Peace Memorial Museum, and I don't recommend that, but if you go and you want to take that, the tour of that place, you can go by yourself and and take a good look. But you can also buy these things called an audio guide. You can go to the counter and you know you pay a few yen and it's a headset. You put it on and at each part of the museum there's a different display. They have a number. For example, number 20 is the bomb and you press number 20 on your handset and it explains you know, all the things about the bomb. Or all, and you know, you go to a different place, and it explains all the different things about that place, and it gives you insight. It helps you understand the significance of these things. They're not there at random, but there was a purpose in all of it. And that personal guide, that audio guide, is what helps us to understand that our Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, is our guide that gives us insight into every single detail, every point in our journey. There is no one better to go with us on our journey than the Holy Spirit. And that's why Paul says, um, you know, in, in Galatians chapter 5, he says, those who live by the Spirit must learn to, to keep in step with the Spirit. Keep in step with the Spirit. Because we're on our journey, and the Spirit has his, his steps. Uh, keep in step, I, I think of it as a dance. When you're, when you're dancing, there's a pattern that you have to keep your feet in when you dance. And life is a journey, and sometimes you've got to dance. And I think the Holy Spirit has a way of dancing that we need to figure out on our journey. I have no idea. Uh, God on our journey means that every step of our journey is led and guided by God's Spirit. Israel would never get to the Promised Land without God's presence. Christ would never, 
Christians would never have eternal life without God's Son, whose death on the cross and resurrection is what allows us to have God's Spirit in our life which is the person who leads and guides us along this journey. It's not where we're going, it's who goes with us. This is the message of Exodus chapter 33. God in our journey, God in our life. Next week we'll be looking at the subject of God on our face. God on our face. I'd like us now to transition into our time of communion, this being the first Sunday of October. It is our custom to celebrate the communion. Uh, so I'm going to ask the worship team if you guys could go ahead and come on up and get yourselves ready for that. In the Japanese service, the custom is to read the passage in, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where Paul writes, For I have received from the Lord what is also I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until it comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. I'd like to invite you to take a look inside to examine yourself before we come before the Lord. are taking the communion. Let's take a moment to pray. the cup and the the bread here and uh, as is our custom we're going to have just everybody come up uh, beginning for the people in the front and then on to the back just to come up and take the bread and the cup to go back to your seats this is a Christian ceremony if you are not a believer in Christ it's okay you don't have to participate in this uh, but if you do believe in Christ and 